Okay, so today we're covering natural selection, which was we probably already covered, um, but we'll go over it again in more detail and learn about it at a higher level. Okay, um, but first of all, from last time, the exercise it was exactly nine heads. So it's kind of a trite result, but eh, what happened? Um, so those of you who guessed nine get two candies, those of you who guessed one get one candy. And at the end, you can all scramble and comp compete over the last two big candies. <coughs> and if you forget what, whether you got it right or wrong, you're, those of you who got it right are up here. Okay. <coughs> Alright, so natural selection. So this is a cool case example of natural selection. Um, a muscle has evolved to have um, an organ that looks like a fish. The fish will come over and try to bite it, and they'll squirt some little Pac-Man-like babies into the fish jaws, grab onto the gills, and both disperse and parasitize. That way. Yeah, this is the cool power, power of natural selection. Okay, so learning outcomes for today. I'm going to learn, think about what's required for natural selection. Learn about selection versus drift versus mutational bias. Okay, so we probably don't think about much. Frequency dependent selection, uh, balancing selection, and selection happening now, even in humans. Okay? So, first, let's talk about what's required for natural selection. So, what we're going to do is break up into groups, and then we'll discuss, we'll select the best definition from the groups. Okay? Um, <coughs> so, think about what you, you know, what you know about natural selection so far, what's required for it. You know, the minimal set of, of, require, of situations required for it to work, okay? Oh, so groups of two to three. Okay, discuss, discuss. Okay, one, one more minute.
doing track. All right. So, what do people think? It's required. What I like you to do is someone someone suggest something, and then everyone else can agree with it, or attack it, or simplify it further. Okay. So. Genetic diversity. Which, which is which? Which genetic variation or genetic diversity, or just variation in general? Okay. Okay. Um, right. So sexual sexual reproduction does generate more variation. That's true. Um, yeah. Oh. Yep. You're right. Yeah. You're, you're right. Let's let's let. No, you need a population, which is true. I mean, if you have one, that's you don't have any variation too. Um, good. Let's 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 do the first one first, and then we'll get back to that. Um, does it need to be genetic? Okay, that's to be heritable, yeah. right? So Other ways of inheriting things that aren't based on genetics. So, so the question is: so we have genetic? So we need genetic variation, right? What if we have variation of other kinds that's not genetic? We still have selection upon it. <laughs> yeah, language. Yep. So like, there's no genes in language, right? But languages evolve. Okay, good. But then let me take a look at to the heritability part. So how would those be heritable? So example is sea otters. So baby sea otters learn how to hunt from their mothers. <coughs> so the mothers go after abalone a lot, so will the babies. The mothers go after urchins a lot, so will the babies. And so um, if you did a sort of common garden experiment or like cross, you know, weird them, you know, a descendant of an abalone hunting mother would, if raised by a urchin hunting mother, hunt urchins, right? So it's not a genetic thing, but just a vertical transmission with some variation um, from learning. Good. So yeah, so variation is required, but may, maybe not genetic variation. Though typically it is genetic. Right? What kind of variation wouldn't be under wouldn't evolve with natural selection? Well, non-heritable variation, right? So what would be the example of non-heritable variation? Right, so a plastic trait, like like you know, big muscles. Yep. Yep. So all the and I'm not sure. Do they know why that is? I guess just in. Yeah, the thing that's you over the lifetimes of the developmental changes as well to that. Um, you know, a dumb example is if, you know, um, something loses its tail. I mean, it's a, that's a stupid example, but that sort of thing can be like working out or not. Good. Okay, so we need variation has to be heritable. Good. All right, so back, back to the, so you said population. 
So why, why population? Mm-hmm. Yep, exactly. Uh, it, well, actually, I, should, I, should, I, should, I shouldn't agree yet. Does anyone else agree? Anyway, anyone want to refine that? Let's well, so so just a uh, counterexample. Okay, because with also similar with genetic variation. So that genetic variation makes sense if something's required. We're always going to think of a counterexample like language, or like learned behaviors that are that are vertically transmitted. Okay, um, so it's one way to do science well is by always trying to find some example that counter that you know disagrees with that what we what is being said. Okay, we're always testing ideas in science. Good it's population. What else? Okay. Okay. Um, like what, what, what would be the biotics example? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, how about abiotic? Temperature, right? So freeze tolerance or heat tolerance. Good. Um, can you think of any exceptions to this idea that you need an agent to select? Your agent can be biotic or abiotic factors. What, what about the yep? Mm -hmm. And so, like, so like genetic drift sort of thing, right? Um, or neutral mutations. Okay, are those part of natural selection? Yeah. I mean, so they're part of evolution, and they're important in evolution, but those processes aren't considered part of natural selection. Yeah. Which is sort of a definitional issue rather than an like actual biological issue, because those do happen, those do matter a lot in terms of evolution. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this leads to a um, long-standing debate in evolution. So there's one school of thought that are called sort of pan-adaptationists. Look at every single trait and think, oh wow, that must be adaptive, right? And so you're going to see people like, so T-Rex, right? So big dinosaur, yeah. little front, front, front legs, right? And so there's a lot of work on what could it do with it, with those legs, right? Are they used in mating? You know, are they used if it's on the ground to help it stand up? Um, you know, how strong are they? Could it you arm wrestling? You know, <coughs> and all these things like that. But actually, what it could be is that there's no longer selection for using those front limbs, and so they just gradually shrunk through time. Right? So the most adaptive thing is lose entirely. It hasn't gotten there yet. Right? The same way that whales still have hips, little hip bones, and little bones, like leg bones at the side. So you use them or anything? No. But you know, they're present. They haven't evolved away completely. So it could be that. So some people think that, you know, they must find an adaptive explanation for every little thing. They will think the thing like Katie does, um, but not everything must be adaptive. What do, what do you folks think? I mean, good scientists have come out on either side of this debate.
So this comes back to sort of our remember dropping lecture we talked about like ex adaptation versus adaptation. And so that's so that's about like whether the origin of the trait the trait evolved for its current function. Um, so you know, if the feathers evolve for flight, they evolve for insulation first. And so they evolve for insulation, then they're ex adapted for flight. And so it's that sort of issue. Is that what you're getting at? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to to lose the four arms here. Yeah, I mean, um, it appears to be there's no longer selection for having four arms. Right? And so they can get bigger or smaller, but if they get bigger, it's more energy to make them. So it's a bit of an adaptive argument. But there could also be arguments that are just about uh, mutation. So lots of cave organisms are blind. right? And so there's two possible explanations for that. Uh, what's, what would be the adaptive one? They're scared of the dark. So, just, you know, have that much tissue to make eyes to waste, have that much brain processing power devoted to it. You know, you know like biographs, five people could have given one of them. That's what thing. So that's the adaptive argument. What's the non-adaptive argument? Mm -hmm. Right. And so you can imagine eyes are a complex thing. There are many ways to break eyes in mutation. And in, in, you know, in lit environments, if you don't work in the eyes, you're going to have something to those that can actually see things from far away. Like in the cave, you might have equal things. And then you just gradually accumulate these mutations as we can't see anymore. Yeah. How can you tell these ideas apart? <coughs> so you know, these are two hypotheses. They're cave fish in Tennessee. How do you go out and test whether the cave fish are being selected for losing eyes or refusing to losing eyes? Uh, what? <laughs> Always the right answer. Um, and it, actually, yes, in this case. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but how? What's my logic? I succeeded in teaching this year. Let me back to the question about you know drift versus natural selection, right? So how do D how does DNA change with drift? So how does DNA so how does DNA change with drift? Mm -hmm. Right. So constant rate. This mutation rate is constant. But there's good. So that's one thing. Um, how about So, here I have one photon and another photon. Okay. This makes the thionine. This one, we don't know, know what this makes. So it's alanine. Okay. So, if we're selected for having work of protein, okay, so it works constantly. Which which DNA bases are most likely to evolve to, 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 to be to be to be evolve and to be substituted in the population? Uh, which of these you know first, second, or third positions? Third. Why? 
Right? In what way? Yeah. Let me know ask it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Beautiful. So the DNA code is redundant, right? So <coughs> we have four bases, right? And we have each cone has three, three, three bases in it, right? So how many possible codons are there? Mm -hmm. Yep. So it's, uh, actually, yeah. So six and four. How many, how many amino acids are there? 20. Okay? So I can encode for many more than I have. So what often happens there in a genetic code is we'll have four codons with the same amino acid. Or some cases, six codons with the same amino acid. Or in rare cases, one codon. But often you hear this redundancy. Right? So that can evolve from ATG to ATC and still have the binding. Right? So the protein function wouldn't be changed. <coughs> now there's a slight selection on these um, called code up, which means code on bias, we're not going to get into. But you know, the first order issue is you change the amino acid or you don't. Okay? So this change wouldn't change the amino acid. Okay? And so it's largely invisible to selection. A change here would. Okay, make a different amino acid. Okay? And like I said, I mean, the, the, the cool thing about code also is the way it's evolved, neighboring amino acids in the mutational space are often are pretty similar to this in sort of size or polarity or that sort of thing. But even so, when you go to a different amino acid, it's deleterious often. Okay? Um, not always, you know, adaptation happens. But usually if you're at a fitness optimum, moving off the optimum somewhere else is probably going to be bad. Okay? So if things are maintained under natural selection, okay, for stabilizing selection, where should we see changes? Or I said it, right? At the third codon position. Right? If this protein isn't used anymore, not under natural selection, where should we see changes? Anywhere. Right? And so one way to test for uh, selection on amino acids is see if the silent substitution rate, so this rate, going, you know, it doesn't change the amino acid, is much smaller, is much bigger than the, the substitution rate that changes the amino acid. Right? If we're, if we're changing amino acids or not at the same rate, that suggests that we're not under selection. If we're only doing silent changes, we must be under stabilized selection. And so for cave fish, we could look at their genes for food and vision and see <coughs> do they have, are they under stabilizing selection or are they not by doing that sort of test of silent versus non silent changes. Does that make sense? Now, what's the wrinkle with that? Again, always, always think about exceptions. Yep, so you know what, what genes to sequence. Good. We're going to look at because we have the whole genome. What else? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Which is where the phylogeny comes in. All right, so if we look at um, here are the cave fish and here are the non cave fish, we can see a lot of you know, both silent and non-silent mutations here. It's just lack of selection. It's only silent here, but it's just selection. Good. Yep, what else? What happens once one gene breaks and you don't have vision anymore? What's the result selection like for the other genes? So let's say K fish are under strong selection to keep to keep their eyes, set, right? And yet, you know, in a small population, 
one of them a gene of that involves gene, eye loss or you know lack of receptors or something so it's the fixation right what's such likely other genes at that point Right, the selection for better hearing and stuff. Yeah. Um, but also the selection for the genes for the evolved vision, now they're not under selection anymore. Right, because the system is broken. And so any of the genes that are involved in that system, you know, even, even if they're you know superbly adapted or not, that vision system is broken, they're not going to be used. Right? So then you would see those genes not under selection. Right? And so they sort of think there's no selection, but actually they've just been broken for a while. You know, the broken system for a while. Good. Well, anyway, does that answer your question? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Other questions about this? Okay. So I think we've covered all the main requirements for natural selection. So we have variation. Right? We have some sort of selective agent. Right? So in this case, we're getting the light ones. Okay. Reproduction with heritable traits and some variation. And actually, that's one thing we did we missed. We didn't talk about re reproduction. Right? So, <coughs> and there's also, this is considered inclusion as well. Okay. So, who can pick holes in these? So, these are sort of the canonical four requirements. Are all of them required? This is, what, this is what you'll see in your Bio 130 textbook if you go back and check it. This revered place on your shelf. Right. So, <coughs> you know, you could have a population that's growing, and then, you know, everything that's born could survive. It's just that some have more offspring than others. Right? So that's possible. In the long run, of course, it's not going to work. Is it maybe humans? Right. Um, <coughs> but in the long run, that won't happen. Right? Um, but that's a good exception. Think about it. You could have a, a population that's really increasing, and this could be happening. Okay, and yet you can still have natural selection. Right. Yeah. Okay. Are they? So also, asexuals are great to bring up because they're always this weird exception to lots of stuff. Right. So we got to talk about like species and stuff. We just give up the asexual species. Um. So, let's we'll say we have an asexual population starting with just one individual, right, and all the, all all of her offspring. Are they identical? Hmm? Are they? What so what causes mutation? Is it so you know is there a way to generate muta generate mutations other than sort of weird meiotic errors or things like that? Radiation? Just DNA you know, copying badly and that sort of thing, right? And so <coughs> there are, you know, there'll be some variation just caused from mutations like that, right? Actually, if you look at like large trees, you know, at different branches, they'll be slightly different genetically because those cell lines have been, you know, mostly you know copy mitosis, 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 but there might be you know, one of them might have a slight a DNA mutation, and so. Then those descendants will vary, right? Um, think about cancer in you, right? I mean, not you, in a human, right? Um, you know, the somatic cells in your mouth cancer aren't having sex with each other, right? But yet there's been mutations, and so you can generate variation. So yeah, so there can be variation in a social population. The advantage of sex, though, which we're going to get to on Monday, is it allows you to make a lot more variation. Asexuals can have variation too. Good. 
Other questions about these? It's pretty cool how minimal these are, right? I mean, so, you know, natural selection as an idea is very, very simple, right? It sort of makes sense. Okay, so we can go and say, yeah, what we was vary? Yes. Actually, this is a discovery. So we can do, you know, an idealized type from all the other species. We can do a similar set type for some indication of that type. And have a bit, you know, a trout with a trout with a trout. And then we know there's variation of the opportunity. Some are heritable. Are they heritable? No. Are they genetically heritable? No. Are they heritable? Well, I'm sure it's pretty easy to survive. Right? You know, we can see it not happening in nature. Right? So, you know, think of any any animal species. You know, how many offspring does a female produce? You know, more than two over a lifetime. Right? Some of the cod produce tens of thousands. Oak trees produce tens of thousands. Right? But if the population is stable, that means out of those tens of thousands, only two survive to adulthood. Okay. Um, and then we need to create heritable traits are more likely to survive and reproduce. Right? Because the selective agent we're talking about. And it could be um, more efficient use of resources, so it could produce more eggs. Right? So it's not simply eating you, just more efficiency. Okay, relative to others in the population. Any questions about this? Okay. So here's a simulation I wrote, um, which we can do in a second. And so up here is our sort of back from the So the height of this shows you fits. Right? So over here and that's here. And then I start the population evolving from here. Okay. Here shows the median. Here's the median. Here's the median. These run here. And these are sexual median. So I'm going to the sexual median. And then we mutate. Okay. And then those that have to survive. And then we have to So. Yep. So we have these percentiles, and then we have instances in pairs. Why isn't everyone right at the maximum here? And this is a very simple simulation where you know there is one peak throughout time. And then many peaks are in real life. So why isn't everyone just stuck right on that peak? Right, so I mean, this selection not not huge, right? So this one might have many of this one. So there's not a ton of selection. There's still some selection. Yeah. What else? In in real life, yes. In this idealized world, no. Yeah. So isn't it good to think about like you know back to the point about simulations versus real life? I mean, that would be something that in real life you have to worry about. Here, we are not worrying about it, and yet, this is something that has some sort of effect. Yeah, good. What else? Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, each, off, each parent has a sediment that's, you know, coming from a normal distribution. Right? So, centered in the parents mean that we will each side is possible. Right? And so, that can lead to some variation here. So basically we're at mutation selection balance. Right, so mutation is causing the spread out to a variety motion, and selection is causing the one near close to the middle to be something that have no offspring. Okay. So if mutation magnitude shrunk, we will get closer. Right? Or if fitness were you know a sort of gentle slope would be like that would sort of stay with the slightly next to the Okay. Mutation selection back. Balance. All right. <coughs> now here I added bias mutation. Okay. And so what we have here is mutation means things getting bigger through time. 
Okay. Um, and so also have two fitness peaks. So what we see here is you know, mutation crazily biased. So if you get the fitness peak, it would have pushed off by this mutation. Okay. If selection were stronger, it would stay closer here despite this mutational bias. And this comes back to the idea of like, why aren't things perfectly adapted? The one thing is these mutations can be pulling away from the selective peak. Okay. All right. So if you go to this website, it's on the first slide too. Um, you can download an exercise, which, which we normally do in class, but we're running out of time because of the good discussion we had earlier. So I won't, I won't have you do this in class now. This is a simple script. Let me show you. Right. Here's a simple script. Okay. This doesn't look simple, probably. It is. Um, but for you guys to run it, you just load this and then you can just use a single function to run it. And so it does is create this fitness slope, this fitness curve, um, and then starts evolving. You can see evolution happening. And so here's all the parents, and then they generate new offspring. This is the negative of these the median. That's CI. Okay. This is the volume. And what you can do is mess around with the parameters of this. Okay. So here's a function. And so we can change we can change the population size. We can change the fitness surface. You can change the mean of mutations. You can have bias mutation, not have bias mutation. And you can affect um, the magnitude of mutation, right? So, you want, so if you want to test my my statement that with less mutation we get closer to the peak, you can do that by just giving a smaller number and running it again. Okay, unless you test these ideas. Okay, so you can try it yourself at home. Um, I've made a link so you can if you don't want to install R on your computer, I don't know why you wouldn't want to, but if you don't want to, there's a way you can do it online too. Okay. It's all free. And open. All right. So back to the lecture. Okay, and so things you can do, you can turn off selection to happen to drift, okay, which you see the variance increasing. Okay. You can try multiple optima. Okay. And since they're asexual, um, so if we have something like Darwin's finches, we get two optima, you know, things that, we, things that were here and things that were here, if they reproduce, the offspring would be this valid, that would be valid. Okay. For the asexual things, they don't mate. So you can evolve to have some on this peak and some on this peak. Um, and then the final thing you do is check, check, check for mutation selection balance. Okay. Okay, so this matters in macroevolution. You know, you know, not everything is adaptive, but lots of things are from adapt adaptation. Okay. Alright, so balancing selection, the selection maintaining diversity. Okay, so natural selection normally just choose through diversity. All right, so we have this variation, and those that are at the peak have more offspring. Those aren't get purged, right? And so we have this you know, pull towards this optimum with the you know, continual mutation as well. Okay, but there are some things that, main, that maintain diversity. Okay, so heterozygote advantage is one. All right, so the all part of this darker homozygote, 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 like that. Right. So here's a classic case. Okay. <coughs> if you're sort of the normal wild type, AA, you can get malaria from mosquitoes. Okay, this is a bad thing. If you have a this trait, you get sick cell anemia. Even worse. Okay. And 
ones in the middle. Um, I saw a clip from there. I'm not clearly if the testing is a 6 to Okay? So they don't have the really effective sense of anemia as of the malaria. So it's adapted in areas that have malaria. Okay? If there's no malaria, it kills a little bit of blood function and brings blood filter for nothing to results. Okay? In malaria areas, is this optimum that has this means having, you know, heterozygous. Okay. So why doesn't the population just become all heterozygous? And that's the optimum, why not be there? Yep, exactly. Think about the next generation. Right. So, if the population was entirely equal at this generation, we would have a mixture. The capacity would become black. Right. <coughs> and so, here we have, you know, we don't have little a, little a getting a little fixed, or big a, big a getting a little fixed, because this is the opposite. Right. Because we're generating these genotypes. Okay. okay. So frequency dependent selection. Okay. So here's a very cool case and the actual story is more complicated than the textbook example. So if we're going to right here. The textbook example is this. There are so Lake Tanganyika cichlids, right? This really good depth of radiation. And there's one the fishes that have evolved to be parasites on the others and bite the scales off them. Okay, so you're in a nice of it, two, three, all the way by the bite the chunk, these off. Okay? And <coughs> in the fifth bite case, these um, parasites have righties or lefties. Right? And so it, their mouths are, shaped, are tilted differently and they attack from different sides. Right? So if you have a knock to like this, we'll attack to this way. So behind, yeah. Okay. <coughs> so if you are a host fish being parasitized, you learn to look over your. If everything in your population were a righty, you'd learn to look over your right shoulder, so to speak. Right. Um, same thing with the left. And so there's always selection for being the rarer phenotype. If you're looking for a righty and you're a lefty, great. And so we see, through time, the ratio of lefties and righties is Okay, because one becomes more common, then the other kind is more adapt is more has more fitness. Let's get pulled back down that way. Okay. So that's an example of frequency dependent selection. Okay, we see the same thing with mating compatibility in. Uh, so solving compatibility in plants, right? We have tons of tons of alleles for this. Because if you have a common allele, then even when you're outcrossing, you won't be able to reproduce because we'll the other plant you're mating with will think that's the same same as itself. Right? So there's lots of selection for having unusual phenotype, unusual genotypes for that. So it causes rapid increase in number of alleles. Okay, because we are ones can mate with anything. There's common ones can mate with a few. Okay, that's frequency dependent selection. Okay. Um, here we see um, what happens with selection um, in, in geographic space, right? So we normally think about populations as this, you know, thing in this bat, right? You have to know populations that are spread out over space. So I have an adaptive mutation here that will spread gradually over the area, okay? Um, <coughs> and if it's, you know, people that are out, people that are throughout, if it's not as good as it being more for the same thing in the areas, right? Um, so we can see different spreads. And so, for example, here are humans, okay? Um, <coughs> and so, we find frequency of this one allele, right? And so, these pie diagrams show the frequency of it. And so, what pattern do you see? Mm -hmm. Yep. So, 
up here is pretty common, so the equator, perfect common ball. Right. How do you know it's not just a neutral allele? It just happens to be more common at the equator. about how humans spread. So we evolved here, and then we spread up here, and spread over this way, over this way, and got into the Americas, we came over this. And so the closest relatives to these are the ones up here, so high frequency. Right? And so the fact that they have a low frequency just then that frequency drop back down. That's something to be against. Okay. So that's some evidence for it. Now again, this could just be chance. So if we are looking at you know ten thousand genes and find something that have that pattern, we'll have it by chance, right? So to be able to detect, and so there's ways to detect what's the chance of it being falsely that's you know a false positive rate. And so we'll try to optimize that. So there's some chance of that. Just go think about. <coughs> and finally, humans evolving, right? So okay, now humans are only under cultural evolution, right? So um, that's what's important now, not natural selection. Okay, but here's some data suggesting that humans are still under selection. So this is a paper a few years ago, 2008, about selection for either male wealth or male hunting ability. Right, so males that hunt well or males that have lots of money, they tend to have more offspring. Okay. And so this shows, you know, in various societies, ranging from the contemporary U.S. to the English in the 16th century, region farmers, um, hunter gatherers, right? And there is some selection for it. Okay. Now, does this mean that there's natural selection happening? If there's, if there's selection pressure? Well, what are, the, what are the four requirements? So we have variation in wealth, certainly. Right? We have, we seem to have it be having differential survival reproduction. Well, what, haven't, what haven't we shown here? Heritability. Right. So, we know we have vertical transmission of wealth in our societies. Maybe that is somewhat heritable that way, right? But maybe hunting ability isn't heritable. Or maybe ability to make wealth isn't heritable, just whether you have wealth or not. Right? So, <coughs> it could be under natural selection or not, because we don't know about the heritability. Okay, any questions about natural selection? Right, good. Do try the exercise at home. I think you'll like it.